and see that. There we go. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just monarch biology, uh, including sort of the migration. Um, I'm also gonna talk about their habitat needs. So that means what do they need for overwintering? What do the adults need? What do the caterpillars need? Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about, um, you know, why monarchs are declining and the trouble that they're in. And then hopefully, and on a hopeful note with lots of information about what every one of us can do to help butterflies. So, I will go ahead and get started. Okay, so really briefly, I think we're pretty much all fairly familiar, familiar with the monarch butterfly life cycle. Um, so they start as an egg, um, hatch out into the sort of familiar striped uh, larva, the caterpillar there, which feeds on milkweed. Um, they uh, form a pupa uh, in the form of a chrysalis and then emerge as an adult. And the host plant for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the caterpillars is milkweed. And milkweed is really the only plant that those monarch caterpillars will eat. But there's a lot of different varieties of milkweed in California and monarch caterpillars will actually eat most of those varieties. So they do eat multiple species of milkweed. And um, I, I chose sort of four species native to the central coast to show on this slide. California milkweed, Indian or woolly pod milkweed, narrowleaf milkweed, and showy milkweed. And what's really interesting about milkweed is that milkweed actually contains toxins called cardiac glycosides. And the monarchs will actually sequester those toxins at all life stages, so caterpillar, pupa, and adult. And what that means is it causes them to taste really, really bad. Now, cardiac glycosides, if you might guess from the name cardiac, that um, that is actually a compound, which if it taken in too great amounts will actually affect cardiac function. And um, for a small animal like a monarch, something like that could very well be lethal, but the monarchs are not affected. They're not poisoned. And in fact, they can eat as much as they want with impunity because they actually have a single mutation in their DNA that prevents the cardiac glycoside from binding to the action site. And so they're basically totally immune to it, which is really cool. Um, okay, so <laughs> I have a, a series of pictures here. So there's a very famous uh, experiment, a researcher named Lincoln Brower conducted um, back in the day where he wanted to test how this bad taste could ensure monarch survival. So what he did was he took a blue jay um, he was, he lives on the East Coast. These are Eastern Blue Jays. And he took a bird that had never seen a monarch butterfly before. And he released a monarch into the cage and the Blue Jay immediately grabbed it, started eating it. So you can see here, it's, it's devouring this monarch. It eats the whole thing, bottoms up. But a couple of minutes later, that Blue Jay was not feeling so good. You can see there's something is wrong this blue jay and pretty shortly thereafter, the blue jay just vomited that monarch right back up. So it caused an upset stomach, it was a horrible taste. And after that, when they offered the bird monarchs, it absolutely refused. So it learned really quickly that that butterfly had a very bad taste and never to eat a monarch ever again. So the milkweed really does provide that protection for monarchs as a whole. Now, every bird has to try at least one monarch to learn that it tastes bad, but um, on the whole, it's a really good defense mechanism for the species. So adult monarchs do not eat milkweed, they drink nectar and they will drink nectar from a ton of different plants, native plants, not native plants. You can see we've got some pictures here of some native and non-native uh, flora that the butterflies are feeding on. Um, all they care about is that it produces nectar and they will drink nectar at all times of year. They especially need it during uh, the breeding season in spring and summer and during migration. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So monarchs also have a really unique life cycle in that they have multiple generations throughout the year and those generations have very different survival strategies. So the summer generations, uh, the adults, live a relatively short time, just a few weeks. They're reproductively active and their primary driver is to find another adult monarch, reproduce, lay eggs, and pass on their genetic material. 
and there are three to four generations throughout the spring and summer. So they're, you know, kind of not living very long, reproducing and, and laying those eggs. Meanwhile, there's also this migratory or overwintering generation. So what happens is the, the last generation of monarchs that is born in the, at the end of summer, um, those, when those caterpillars uh, pupate, they come out of the chrysalis as adult, those adults um, live much longer. So they live six to eight months. They're the ones that migrate and they are not reproductively active in the fall and the winter, only in the spring. So they're, when they come out um, as adults in the, at the end of the summer and in the early fall, they have the urge to migrate. They're not interested in finding a mate. They've got to get to the overwintering sites. And so what that means too, if you really think about it, is those butterflies that then go to the overwintering sites and stay there, they're actually separated by multiple summer generations uh, from the ones that were there before. So the butterflies coming to the coast right now are not the same ones that were here last year. In fact, there's several generations separated from those butterflies that were here yet last year. So really interesting. So this is a map showing um, monarch migration. I know it looks a little bit busy, but um, the uh, red, sort of dark red arrows are showing fall migration. So you can see we've got two populations in North America, the Eastern population and the Western population. The Eastern population uh, breeds throughout Eastern North America and goes to Mexico for the winter. And then uh, the yellow arrows show spring migration. So they return back up to Eastern North America in the spring. And if you look at the Western US, um, you can see that the Western monarchs kind of come from all over the Western US and most of them come to uh, the California coast for the winter. You can see the little zone of, of red on the coast there, but do notice that some of them do go to Mexico. So if, uh, a small proportion of Western monarchs actually do migrate to Mexico. And we know that through tagging studies where we recovered monarchs tagged in the Western US in Mexico. And what that means is that those, those populations are mixing. And because they're mixing, um, they're not genetically uh, distinct enough to be two species. So even though the Eastern and Western monarchs are doing different things, they're still all the same species. Okay, let's talk briefly about migration. So uh, monarch butterflies urge to migrate is triggered by the changing day length and uh, changing temperatures. And they prepare for migration by putting on body fat. They use that fat as fuel for the migration as well as energy reserves to last throughout the winter. Now I know I can hear you asking, how could, is there such a thing as a fat monarch? And the answer is actually yes. So here's a picture. If you look, the monarch on the left actually has a plumper abdomen than the one on the right. So that butterfly on the left is ready to migrate. So monarchs migrate during the day they glide along on high altitude winds. Um, early in the morning when it's cooler, they are flying a little closer to the ground, but as the air warms, they'll ride thermals up and they will glide on high altitude winds. Mainly they're flying a few hundred feet off the ground, but they have actually been seen by glider pilots at altitudes of over 10,000 feet, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Most butterflies aren't migrating that high. They have to stop every night uh, to spend the night. They'll shelter in a tree or a shrub or some other place along the way in the morning. They have to find nectar, refuel, and then take off. And monarchs can travel hundreds or even thousands of miles. So I'm not gonna go into too much depth about how monarchs do it, but just really briefly, I wanna give you some fast facts about monarch migration because I think it's so fascinating. So monarchs have an amazing ability to navigate. They can use the sun, the position of the sun and their own internal clock to fix their own heading uh, throughout the day in order to uh, use the sun as a compass to decide which way to travel. They can also sense polarized light. So if the sun is hidden by clouds, they can see bands of polarized light sky and deduce the position of the sun from that. And if it's, even if it's totally cloudy and they can't see the sky or the sun, monarchs can also detect the magnetic field of the earth. So this is a, a kind of a cool little diagram I like to show. This is sort of a stylized picture of a monarch head. You're kind of looking face on at the monarch with the eye on the left. 
And um, so the eyes can detect that visible light in the position of the sun. The dorsal rim area on the eye detects polarized light. They have a clock uh, in their antenna, which tracks the time of day, and they have a compass capable of detecting the magnetic field of the Earth also in their antenna. And so when you put all those things together, monarchs really have an amazing array of tools to navigate. It's quite fascinating. Okay, let's talk about where they're going. So Western monarch butterflies, the vast majority of them are coming to the coast of California and they are heading to special overwintering sites on the coast. And here is a picture. Oh gosh, I didn't change this. <laughs> I gave a talk to Pacific Grove a couple days ago and I forgot to swap out my slow slide. So I apologize. <laughs> San Luis Obispo is a, a little farther south from that. Uh, monarchs aggregate at overwintering sites on the California coast from north of San Francisco all the way down to San Diego and even down into Baja. So the yellow dots all represent an overwintering site where monarchs have been recorded as aggregating for the winter. So this uh, map shows about a 600 mile stretch of coast and there are hundreds of historic sites, um, you know, anywhere like around three or 400 sites where monarchs have been documented overwintering but really in any one given year, probably really only around uh, 100, 150 of those are gonna actually have butterflies. So not every single one of these yellow dots has monarchs every year. The overwintering sites are really special and they have to meet very special criteria. So the overwintering sites are usually a grove of trees and they're very often in an amphitheater or horseshoe formation. So think of a grove of trees with an opening in the center or an opening on one side. And these groves must have exactly the right microclimate. Um, monarch butterflies are a lot like Goldilocks. The conditions have to be just right. So they are looking for a grove of trees that has the exact right temperature, humidity, amount of sunlight, and wind, if it's, if it's too windy or too sunny or too hot or too cold or anything like that, they will not stay at the site. And the arrangement of the trees is actually what's um, contributing to that microclimate. So when the trees are arranged in a specific way, it results in the conditions that the monarchs like. Also very important to them, is that the site must have an intact canopy because that canopy is really crucial to maintaining the right microclimate. The canopy acts kind of like a blanket to trap heat at night and it also provides shelter from the wind and the rain. And so, you know, all those things, the structure of the arrangement of the trees, the structure of the trees, the canopy of the trees, all those things are contributing to that microclimate. So that's why monarch butterflies don't roost or, or gather in just any old grove of trees. It's only very special and specific groves of trees. And at these overwintering sites, monarchs will form these big dense clusters. They will gather together in large numbers throughout the winter and they cluster on a variety of tree species, including eucalyptus. So these are clusters of monarchs on blue gum eucalyptus. They'll also cluster on Monterey pine and Monterey cypress. And we do have uh, both of those species in San Luis Obispo County. You can see here, they really pack together even more densely on those species. And they'll also cluster on Coast Redwood. Um, this is a picture from an overwintering site in Big Sur. So where Coast Red is, Redwood is native uh, uh, in Big Sur and on the central coast, they will definitely cluster there as well. So you might wonder, well, okay, they come to these sites and they gather in these you know, groups, these clusters, why the heck are they doing it? Well, it's actually advantageous to them to cluster at cold temperatures because in those really big clusters, uh, researchers have found it's actually a little bit warmer kind of in the center. So the, the butterflies can actually pack together and survive the winter a little better when they're in those clusters. Also, the age old saying there is safety in numbers, um, even though monarch butterflies are sequestering those toxic uh, chemicals from milkweed, which gives them a very bad taste, there actually still are a few birds and animals that can eat those butterflies, and they definitely will. Um, uh, Western kingbirds, chickadees, 
Spotted toeys are just a few of the species that have been documented eating monarch butterflies. Uh, scrub jays will do it too. And many of you may have seen um, that happen. And yellow jackets will also go after monarch butterflies. And if the butterflies fall on the ground, some uh, small rodents like mice will also eat them. So there's a lot of um, protection sort of in numbers because a predator will have a very hard time picking out just one butterfly to go after in the cluster. So it's uh, helpful for them to group together. Um, I mentioned how the monarchs put on fat. We saw that picture of the fat monarch <laughs> earlier. And in addition to fueling their migration, those that fat actually provides a store to live off of because historically, uh, before um, European settlers, settlers came to the coast and brought lots of non-native European plant species with them, there's really not too many native plant species that bloom during the winter. And so really there wasn't very much nectar around, so they really needed those fat stores to live off of. Now, if their fat stores run out, they do need to search for nectar. We'll talk more about that later. So they hang out you know, in these clusters all winter, and then there's a big mating frenzy in the spring, in uh, around February, sometimes even in January if the weather's really warm. And then the monarchs will leave the overwintering site and they will disperse and they will go out to find milkweed. Okay, so now you know a little bit about the life cycle of the monarchs and we've got to talk about what the heck is going on with these butterflies. So Western monarchs unfortunately are in decline and it's a really serious decline. And I know a lot of you on this, uh, on this Zoom call probably uh, are probably aware of that um, and so here is a graph showing the rather shocking decline in Western monarch butterflies. So this data comes from the Western monarch Thanksgiving count. And this is an annual count. It's the last three weeks of November or last two weeks of November and first week of December kind of in there where volunteers go out uh, throughout uh, the, the coast of California and they visit as many overwintering sites as possible and they do a massive survey of all of these sites. It's basically like the annual monarch census and they count all these butterflies and in the 80s and 90s there were well over a million butterflies in western North America but that population really dropped off in the 2000s and for most of the 2000s we were holding steady at around a quarter million of uh, 200 to 300,000 monarch butterflies, which was a pretty small percentage of what we had back in the day. And then in 2018, the population crashed even further. So for the last two winters, 2018 and 2019, the population was actually hovering around 30,000, which is pretty shocking when you think about five years ago, just the Pismo Grove overwintering site you know, Pismo Beach, just that site had 30,000. Um, and now in, in all the sites in California, we can only find 30,000. And this year, unfortunately, it's looking like it's going to be even fewer butterflies. So this, this drastic decline has happened. Monarchs have dropped like 97% from their historic uh, numbers in the 80s and 90s. So what the heck is going on? Why is this happening? Okay, so... We've, our researchers and, and conservationists and people have obviously spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck is going on so we can figure out how to stop or reverse it. So here's a big one, climate change. I know that we've all just heard tons about climate change. Now, climate change is really impacting uh, our wildlife and for monarchs, no exception. Climate change is really um, driving a lot of changes in their habitat, breeding habitat and overwintering habitat, as well as impacting their metabolism. I'll go into that a little more in a minute, but also land use changes. So um, people are changing uh, the habitats that are out there. Uh, we are losing overwintering sites and we are losing breeding habitat. And remember, monarchs have to have milkweed to breed. So as, as milkweed goes away, as it's um, you know, in areas that are being farmed or developed, we're losing this critical habitat. Monarchs can't reproduce or survive the winter without the habitat they need. And last but definitely not least, um, the increasing amounts of pesticides that are being applied to the landscape um, are doing monarchs no favors. Um, pesticides are chemicals engineered to kill insects 
And even though pesticides are mostly not being applied directly to areas where monarchs may live or breed, pesticides are carried on the wind. Pesticide drift uh, causes um, these chemicals to be blown outside of the areas where they're applied. And they can end up on milkweed or uh, nectar plants that uh, caterpillars and adults need. So it's a pretty serious situation. I want to I want to go a little more in depth about what's going on with e with each of these factors. So climate change, um, one of the sort of most drastic and direct results of climate change that that we've seen is uh, in a degradation of the overwintering sites. So uh, increasing drought and um, severity of storms is actually causing overwintering sites to become less suitable for monarch butterflies. And drought is killing uh, eucalyptus trees, which are not drought adapted, and uh, causing trees to topple over. And um, it's just reducing the amount of viable habitat. Uh, climate change, as the temperatures average temperatures increase, it's changing the availability of milkweed and nectar plants. So in uh, drought situations, in severe drought, milkweed and nectar plants are absolutely negatively uh, impacted. There's just going to be fewer plants available for monarchs. Climate change also affects the timing of departure from overwintering sites. And, and those of you that have uh, lived in the San Luis Obispo uh, area for a long time, or on the Central Coast for a long time, might notice this. Uh, if you went to the Pismo Beach Monarch Grove 10 or 15 years ago, you would see monarchs there all the way into March, and very often even into the end of March. Nowadays, um, monarchs are leaving these overwintering sites much earlier because if you remember early in the presentation, we talked about how migration is triggered by not only changing day length, but also temperatures. So as uh, nighttime temperatures increase and get warmer, those overwintering monarchs are receiving a signal that oh, spring is coming, it's time to leave. Well, the winter temperatures are increasing to the point where it's kind of sending this confusing signal to monarchs. And so they actually start leaving the overwintering sites too early. They're leaving in January and February. And the reason that's not a good thing is that the milkweed that they need to lay their eggs on hasn't grown yet. So milkweed doesn't really start, start popping up and getting big enough for monarchs to use until March or even April, depending on kind of where you are in the state. So they're leaving the overwintering sites too soon and going out there and not finding any milkweed to lay their eggs on because uh, their sense of timing is off. So it's, it's causing a real problem. Um, and then last but not least, uh, rising temperature also in, uh, impacts monarch metabolism. So the uh, caterpillars, um, their development is actually impacted if the temperature gets too hot. Uh, we actually see that to a certain degree, increasing temperatures help uh, monarch larvae develop. When you get to a certain level, when it's too hot, it actually slows their development. And again, overwintering monarch butterflies, uh, remember those fat reserves, um, if the uh, temperature is too hot, it actually affects the monarch's metabolism because they are exothermic organisms. That means that their uh, body temperature is linked to the outside temperature. Like for instance, we are not, we're endothermic. My body temperature is constant, no matter if it's hot or cold outside, but monarch butterflies, their internal temperature is affected by the outside temperature. So if it's very hot, their metabolism goes up and they start burning through those fat reserves much quicker. And if they use up their fat reserves before the end of the winter, they have to find more nectar. And if there's no nectar at the overwintering site, that could be a real problem for that butterfly. Okay, I realize this is a lot of doom and gloom, <laughs> but I really wanna drive home what's happening to these sites. So. The degradation of overwintering sites is, is uh, really being accelerated by climate change. Um, these are pictures of eucalyptus groves where monarchs have historically clustered. And you can see that really uh, eucalyptus, <laughs> not only is it not native, but it is not a drought tolerant species. And so these are photos of trees that have been killed by uh, the prolonged drought that we had just a few years ago. Um, these are uh, sites in San Luis Obispo County uh, that were where those trees were perfectly healthy like seven, eight, nine years ago. And after, you know, for a few years of drought, 
they're, they're pretty much done. It, and you can see the real impact here is loss of canopy. So that canopy, which is so critical to the microclimate at a site is going away uh, if the trees you know, are being stressed by drought or even killed. And so that affects the microclimate at the site. It means the site is no longer suitable for overwearing butterflies and they will leave and they have to try and find another site. So I wanna show you guys, uh, this is an example um, and just really brings home kind of the dramatic loss of canopy we're seeing. And actually you too can see this if you go on Google Earth, which you can get for free, you can actually look at, at time-lapse and see the difference. So this is a picture of a site called Halcyon Hill. It's in Halcyon in Southern San Luis Obispo County. And this is a site, a historic monarch butterfly overwintering site where Historically, there've been many thousands of butterflies using this site. This picture is taken in 2007, pre-drought, uh, pre that severe drought that we had starting in, in 2012, 2014, or 2014. Here is what it looks like 11 years later. This is an aerial photo from 2018. After the drought, the canopy has just dramatically decreased because these trees are totally stressed and dying. I'm gonna go back, so before, after. Look at that. You can see all that ground. The canopy is just almost non-existent now. And when eucalyptus trees start dying, they become a fire hazard. They're already a fire hazard when they're alive, because, but they can become even more of a fire hazard. And so landowners and homeowners, you know, to protect the safety of their property, will cut those eucalyptus trees. So you just get this cycle where you know, the drought kills the trees or weakens them, and then the trees get removed because now they're a, a public safety hazard. And this is what we're seeing actually um, in the last couple of years, uh, utility companies, uh, PG&E uh, up here and SoCal Edison down south are just doing this aggressive program of power line trimming where they're really cutting just any and all trees that are remotely near power lines. Um, and we're also seeing just a lot of trimming and removal of trees that are potentially a fire hazard around property and that's really eucalyptus. So even now with awareness of monarchs at an all time high, overwintering sites are being lost because of this. And so we really need to protect as much overwintering habitat as possible. Okay, last but not least, talk really briefly about pesticides. So um, a lot of research has focused on neonicotinoid pesticides, also known as neonic pesticides for short. Uh, these, you may have heard about uh, neonic pesticides because they've been implicated in honeybee declines. And um, there's been a, several papers out which have shown that they do impact butterflies. So this is a paper from 2016. The researchers went all around California and they matched the amount of pesticides applied to the number of butterfly species that they found. And these were uh, butterfly surveys conducted over many years. And um, like I said, kind of throughout the state. And so on the left, you've got the graph showing in different counties, the amount of pesticides being applied. You can see it's going up and up and up. And the number of butterfly species found um, as you, in, in relationship to pesticide use. So the more pesticides being used, the fewer species of butterflies found on these surveys. So um, our, our landscape is really changing. And neonicotinoid pesticides are very popular. Here's a graph just showing, you know, from when they were introduced in the early 90s up through kind of the, the early 2010s that it's just going up drastically since their, since their introduction. Okay, I just spent like 10 minutes giving you guys like the worst news. Oh my gosh, so many things are going wrong. Is there any hope? Like, what can we do? Can we even make a difference? And I'm here to tell you, yes, we can't give up. Um, monarch butterflies, they're an insect and like pretty much all insects, they have a very high reproductive capability. And what I mean by that, females can lay a lot of eggs. An individual monarch female can lay over 400 eggs. All they need is suitable habitat. So if we can conserve, protect and restore monarch habitat, they can bounce back. So here's the good part. Okay, I'm about to lay a ton of stuff on you guys, how you can help. Okay, so first, 
Here's a great thing to do is support organizations or entities that protect and manage overwintering sites. So here in San Luis Obispo County, State Parks manages the Pismo Beach Monarch Grove. It's really the biggest and, and most important overwintering site in our county. And they do a really, really great job of not only protecting the site, but also managing it. They're doing active habitat restoration. They're planting trees, they're planting nectar plants. Um, so, you know, support state parks. You can go visit the site, buy stuff, you can donate to them, but also just any organization that is managing monarch sites. So uh, for instance, in North County up in Cambria, uh, Friends of the Fiscally Neat Ranch Preserve, um, there's monarch sites up there. So they're protecting and managing their sites. Um, and if you, you may know somebody who has monarch butterflies on their property, you know, encourage and support them to manage their property with monarchs in mind. You can also apply political pressure. So contact your local politicians, um, the mayor, the city council, your state representative, your state senator, your federal senator, you know, get the word out, ask for better legal protections of monarch habitat right now. Unfortunately, monarch habitat, especially overwintering habitat, really is not very, there's, there's not too many legal teeth um, to the protections that are in place. And monarch butterflies themselves are actually not really protected in any way. They're not listed, they're not under federal protection or anything like that. So we need to continue to apply pressure to our decision makers and our legislators to you know, make those laws. Here's a big one. I showed you that crazy graph of rising pesticides. Well, you can, you know, basically vote with your dollars and buy organic if you can. I know organic is more expensive. I'm definitely not fully organic myself, but uh, the more organic you buy, we show we, we can move away from reliance on pesticides and not just buy organic in your fr fruits and vegetables, but also go organic at home if you have a garden don't use pesticides in your yard or garden. Encourage your friends and neighbors to do the same. There's a lot of alternative pest control methods. Integrative pest management is really big. Get those ladybugs, use soap and water. There's, there's a lot of different ways you can uh, manage your garden without using chemicals. So strongly urge you guys to do that. You can also become a citizen scientist uh, or a community scientist, and you can help researchers gather data on monarch butterflies, track what's going on with the population and where they are. You can volunteer to count monarchs. The Western Monarch uh, Thanksgiving count is starting today, um, and that's organized by the Xerces Society. And this website that I'm showing you guys is kind of the, the uh, organization website. You can go to that website if you're interested in getting involved in the count, you can go there. You can actually look on a map and see if there's any overwintering sites near you that you can volunteer to monitor. And that count is happening right now. There's also a second count in January known as the New Year's count. So if you're interested, you can reach out to Xerces. I'm actually the San Luis Obispo County uh, coordinator for the Monarch Thanksgiving count. So you can go to that website and actually find my email address because I'm the county coordinator um, and send me a message if you want to get involved. But you don't actually, you don't even have to go outside of your own property. You can monitor monarchs in your own backyard. If you have a smartphone, you can download the iNaturalist app. And this is a great way. It's actually really fun because you can put in any and all wildlife sightings that you have, and not just wildlife, but native plants too. And that all gets uploaded to a big database and it's such a good way for researchers to get data. And the Xerces Society who manages the count uh, of overwintering sites, they also get data from iNaturalist. And there's a whole host of really awesome community science projects that are out there for you to give data to. So you can report if you see monarchs in your backyard, drinking nectar from your flowers or even laying eggs on, on milkweed if you have any, you can report it to Journey North, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper and Monarch, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. These are all citizen science based projects which rely on data from people just like you. Um, and uh, it's really fun to participate in these projects and you are contributing really important data to monarch conservation science.
Okay, now I know several people, <laughs> if you're coming to a talk that has something to do with the Botanic Gardener, you're a gardener probably. So uh, I'm sure the gardeners are out there are like, well, what can I do? What can I plant? Okay, good news. You can absolutely plant a nectar garden. This is a concrete, immediate and tangible way that you can help not only monarch butterflies, but a whole suite of native pollinators. That is by planting a, a nectar garden. You can feed those adult butterflies as they come to our, come to the coast in the fall and uh, as they're here over the winter and then as they're getting ready to leave in the spring. So if you are looking for monarch friendly plants to plant, I would suggest trying to get a lot of plants that are sort of really late blooming. So late summer, fall blooming plants, as well as kind of early winter stuff. So stuff that blooms in maybe January, February, March because then you're giving a boost, a, a snack to those butterflies as they're leaving the overwintering sites and heading out to find milkweed. There are tons of plants. I, I couldn't even, I could give probably an entire presentation on just what to plant. And there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, this is just a little sampling of suggestions that you can plant for monarchs, but there are a lot of resources online the, uh, you can just, honestly, you can go online and you can search Monarch Nectar Plants California. You can even go more specific. You can go Monarch Nectar Plants Central California, San Luis Obispo, um, the Monarch Joint Venture and the Xerces Society, uh, their websites have nectar li uh, lists sort of by bloom time and by type of plant. There's so many really great resources out there. Um, and if you're planting uh, a nectar garden for monarchs, you're also going to benefit lots of other insects too. Okay, so that's a great thing to do. Now you can also plant milkweed. Monarchs have to have milkweed. Those larvae will really only eat milkweed, but it's really important to plant native milkweed and to plant it away from the coast and away from the overwintering sites. And the reason for that is historical herbarium records actually show that milkweed was, was not found immediately on the coast north of Santa Barbara. So when you get to Santa Barbara and point southward, milkweed was growing directly on the coast, but in San Luis Obispo County, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, um, all the way north, Milkweed was not historically found right on the coast. And that's because our climate right on the coast is not super great for milkweed. So it's a little too cold and foggy. Milkweed likes hot and dry. So milkweed is found, um, it grows uh, historically and natively in interior San Luis Obispo County, but really not on the coast. The other issue with planting milkweed too close to the overwintering sites is that because we get, we're getting tons of monarchs coming in, so you're getting really high density uh, concentrations, just high numbers of butterflies on the coast, and milkweed planted too close to the overwintering site will just get swamped. They'll get overwhelmed with eggs. Milk monarchs will just lay a bunch of eggs all over the milkweed. I've seen milkweed in people's gardens with like 30 or more eggs, and you know when those caterpillars hatch out, there's not enough milkweed and they'll actually starve unless you literally drive to the store and get more. So it's just really not a good idea. Um, so if you live more inland, plant milkweed, but if you're on the coast, I would say plant a nectar garden. That's gonna be most helpful. And I've listed four of our kind of native species. Um, okay, and here's some pictures, narrow leaf milkweed, showy milkweed. Again, lots of resources online if you're looking for what milkweed species might be right for your a particular you know area tons of resources online um okay what about tropical milkweed this is a question i get a, a lot and i really only have about five more minutes <laughs> left so i'm going to kind of blaze through this but tropical milkweed it's asclepius curasavica it's got a bunch of other common names it's really easy to grow and it's easy to buy and actually monarchs love it. They will definitely lay eggs on it. The caterpillars will eat it. It seems like a great solution. And when you go to a lot of the big, big box nursery stores like Home Depot or Lowe's or places like that, and you ask for milkweed, that's what they have because it's so easy to grow. Okay, seems great. Is it good for them? Well, 
in 2015, <laughs> there was kind of like a news explosion. The news was everywhere. Gardeners were killing monarchs. And a lot of you who are gardeners might actually remember this. The you know, headlines were crazy that milkweed was killing monarchs, blah, 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 blah. It was just this frenzy. And, but what was really going on? Well, those crazy headlines stemmed from the publication of a paper in 2015 about tropical milkweed and OE. OE is a naturally occurring parasite found in monarchs. So just quickly, I'm gonna go through sort of what's really going on with tropical milkweed and OE. So OE stands for Ophirocystis electroshira. That's a protozoan parasite from now on, I will just be saying OE. And the spores are found on the abdomen of adult monarchs. So here's a picture showing, um, zoomed in on the abdomen of a monarch. Those large things are the scales on the butterfly and those teeny, teeny 10 micron uh, things are the spores of OE. Um, this pr uh, parasite has co-evolved with monarchs and has coexisted with them for, we think, a very long time. And OE transmission occurs from adults to larvae. So what happens is the adult monarch, when it lays eggs on milkweed, some of the spores fall off the monarch's body onto the milkweed. And then when the caterpillar hatches, it eats the spores on the milkweed. So the transmission goes from adult to milkweed to larva. And getting infected with OE can come with a lot of costs. So there's increased risk of mortality, shorter lifespan, smaller body size, reduced mating. Um, Dr. Sonia Altizer is a researcher who studied this extensively and she actually attached monarchs to a flight mill, which looks like this, to kind of glue butterflies to this little contraption. And she showed that monarchs heavily infected with OE fly slower and they're not as good migrants. And she discovered that migration distance actually matters the longer the migration, the lower the disease prevalence. And so you can see that the Eastern population going to Mexico, which is a much longer journey, they really only have about 8% of their butterflies heavily infected. The Western population has about 30% of butterflies heavily in infected. And Florida is a non-migratory uh, population, very high infection rates. So what is going on there? So the 2015 study basically looked at OE infection rates in these four different groups. I'm just gonna kind of blaze through this. I'm sorry, I'm rushing a little bit. But the results showed uh, this graph. So what we've got here on the vertical axis on the left, that's the proportion of heavily infected monarch butterflies where the infection load could re be harmful to them. And the black and white columns are just results for two different years of the study. But I want you to look along the bottom and see these are the different geographic areas they sampled. So summer breeding grounds where the monarchs are breeding on native milkweed at the Mexican overwintering grounds, at coastal overwintering sites actually along the Gulf Coast and at winter breeding sites. And they found that boy, winter breeding sites, those areas had a significantly higher proportion of heavily infected monarchs than anywhere else. What is going on at winter breeding sites? Well, every single winter breeding site had year-round tropical milkweed because it was the only plant alive, the only milkweed plant around. Unlike native milkweed, tropical milkweed does not die back in the winter unless there is a hard freeze, which means it can stay green all year round in places like the Gulf Coast or here in Central California. And milkweed is triggering monarchs to lay eggs, even if it's outside the quote unquote normal breeding season, even if it's the middle of winter, if monarchs find milkweed, they'll lay eggs on it. And because that tropical milkweed doesn't die back, it continues to accumulate OE spores. So if you really think about that, you've got you know, monarchs coming and laying eggs and the, the plant parts never really die. So you're just getting more and more and more heavily infected milkweed. Those caterpillars are ingesting it until basically you get to a situation where tropical milkweed basically becomes kind of a death trap for monarchs. So what should you do? Long story short, don't plant tropical milkweed, plant native, if you live in an area where planting milkweed is appropriate. If you already have tropical milkweed, which I know lots of people who still do, you don't have to rip it all out, but you have to manage it. And so what that means is cutting it back, cutting it all the way back in the winter and keeping it cut back. We wanna try and get it to mimic that native monarch, or excuse me, native milkweed phenology. So keep it cut back, okay?
Okay, so in summary, what we can do to help monarchs, plant nectar plants, plant native milkweed if you live away from the coast, go organic, try and get off pesticides, become a monarch advocate in everything you do, talk to your local politicians and help collect data. And by doing all of these things, we can really give monarchs a chance and hopefully see that migration uh, return every year. So with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Ooh, I went a little bit long, but we still have some time for questions. So I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can uh, listen to some questions. Okay. Ooh. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, so yeah, I'll read some questions. I have a question from Nancy. She says that I rescued and released 16 monarchs this fall in Virginia. They were raised on African milkweed. Do you think uh -huh. travel to California or Mexico? So if you released them, that's a great question. If the monarchs were released in Virginia, they're going to go to Mexico. If they were brought from Virginia to California, you know what? That's a great question. And in fact, uh, sort of back in the day, there were quite a few uh, translocation studies, they called them, where, where people actually took Western monarchs you know, over to the Eastern US and vice versa. And what they found is that it seems to be actually pretty random. Um, we do have, if you remember from the beginning of the talk, we did show that there are some Western monarchs do go to Mexico. And what we currently think, we're not 100% sure why some of them do that. And, and while most of them go to the coast, we think it probably has to do with prevailing weather conditions in those areas. So which way the wind is blowing and, and all that good stuff. So um, it's a great question. And I, there's really no way to know, like the only way for you to find out would be if you tagged those adult monarch butterflies before you release them. And then we might, uh, somebody might see the tagged butterflies somewhere, but um, yeah, they could, they could go either way. They could go to Mexico or they could actually go to California. Those translocation studies have shown that they can do both. Okay, cool. All right, so this question is from Cynthia. She wonders how will the fires this summer have affected the monarch migration? That's a great question. Um, that's also a question I get a lot. So and it's, a, it's a very valid concern, especially in the last few years with the increasing uh, area, severity, and intensity of our fires. So long story short, um, research has shown that monarch butterflies can migrate through and complete their migration through uh, an area that is full of smoke. So uh, tagged butterflies from the Pacific Northwest, from uh, Washington and Oregon, have made it uh, while fires were raging and burning. They've flown through that area and they've safely arrived at the overwintering sites in California. So they can do it. What we don't know is how uh, flying through those areas may impact the butterfly's overall fitness. So will having to migrate through a lot of smoke mean that when the butterfly gets to where it's going in California, will it be weaker or less able to survive the winter? We don't actually know that. So. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, it's unfortunately pretty tough to study um, because it depends on us kind of knowing how many migrating monarchs might be killed by fires. That is a really tough thing to study. Um, but we do know that tagging studies have shown that monarchs can and do migrate through areas where wildfires are burning. So they at least, we do know that. So it's a great question and don't have a complete answer. Okay. So um, just to repeat, if, if you joined the talk late and you have a question, type them into the chat bar and I will read them here. Um, so we have a question from James Irving who says, my ranch has many acres of milkweed. Excuse me, let me say that again. My ranch has many acres of milkweed, which comes up when I clear areas of Ooh, maybe chamise and other brush. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. Uh huh, chamise, yeah. Chamise, okay. But I've never seen monarch or larvae on them. 
and I'm in the Adelaide area next to Lake Nasimiano. Can I get larvae to place on the milkweed? Does the plant need to grow active or need to growing actively? Hmm. Okay, this is this is actually a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, so something that um, I didn't really touch on this in my presentation, but something that uh, researchers are actually really starting to focus on now is the the Western monarch butterflies, their habitat needs actually seem to be a little bit different than Eastern monarchs. And when you really think about it, it makes sense because the climate in Eastern North America is very different than out here. The West is far more arid. It's hotter and drier. The, for those of you that have spent time in the East, the, hum, the summer is horrible. I'm from Chicago. It is hot and it is humid. Most importantly, it's very humid. So the mantra for many years coming out of uh, the conservation movement for Eastern monarch butterflies was, if you plant it, they will come. Like if you plant milkweed, it almost doesn't matter where or when you plant it, you're gonna get monarchs because just everywhere is suitable. However, what we're starting to learn is that in Western North America, that might not actually be the case. Um, we think now that monarch butterflies are actually a lot more picky about the climate conditions that the milkweed is growing in. So if the area where the milkweed is growing is really hot, really sunny, uh, or really dry, it, it seems like we're actually seeing fewer monarchs using those areas. So um, my uh, the company that I work for um, the principals who run the company, they live in Paso Robles. They're kind of on the outskirts of Paso Robles and they have many, many acres. They have a ton of milkweed. My boss is Dan Mead, who has been working with monarch butterflies for, geez, 30 plus years, uh, especially down in Santa Barbara. And he knows monarchs and they really don't get a ton of monarchs on their milkweed out in that area. And that's actually long been a question um, you know, sort of the West does have areas of milkweed, but seemingly just no monarchs to use it. So what we're thinking now is that probably the most important thing that is contributing to the decline of the monarch butterflies is not actually lack of milkweed, although there's definitely less milkweed than there was, but it's probably more um, the uh, nectar resources found during migration and the overwintering sites and what might be happening there. So it's amazing that you have milkweed and that's fantastic. And I would encourage you to, you know, continue managing your property in such a way that like, you know, if you get milkweed, that's really awesome. And to keep looking and checking on that milkweed um, to see if you can get monarch butterflies. I do not know of any place where you can get caterpillars to kind of like stock, like introduce them to that milkweed because unfortunately the monarch population is now really low. And so um, there's, it's, and, and breeding, captive breeding of monarch butterflies is actually kind of controversial um, because there's quite a few prominent monarch researchers who feel that the, uh, breeding of monarchs in, in labs and captivity for sale is that the monarch butterflies that are being produced are maybe not the most healthy or the most fit. Um, we don't really know too much about kind of what's going on with their genetics. Um, there was actually a paper that came out last year that showed that monarchs raised in captivity, uh, their ability to migrate is actually impaired. Um, and I'm not talking necessarily about uh, like a monarch you found in your garden that you then brought inside, raised as, and then released. But I meant one that have spent, you know, like multiple generations, like being raised in captivity. So unfortunately, I don't know if there's a, a place where you can get um, monarchs to have on your land, um, but it is fantastic that you do have milkweed. Um, that makes me really happy. <laughs> um, but it could just be that, that area is maybe a little too hot or dry for them to use right now. And, you know, the climate has been changing. It could be that 10 or 15 years ago, if you had monarchs there, you might have them, but maybe now 
the conditions aren't quite right. There's still a lot that we really don't know. Okay, in just the few minutes we have left. Oh yeah, sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. Oh. I'll try and keep it short, like lightning round. Right. So two more milkweed questions. Okay. Uh, this person, uh, let's see, Carolina says, I have tropical milkweed that many larvae have hatched on and I bought more milkweed to feed them. So should she cut the milkweed back? She doesn't want the caterpillars to start. Oh, uh, you've engaged in the cycle. <laughs> this is the tough part for a lot of people that do have tropical milkweed because the problem is, is that you're, the right when that milkweed should be cut back is when you get caterpillars on it because the butterflies are coming to the coast. They find the milkweed in like, you know, September, October, they start reproducing on it and it's like, oh crud. Well, now it's winter, I'm supposed to cut it back, but it's covered in, in milkweed or in, in caterpillars. So yeah, this is a, a little bit of a tricky situation. Um, and you know, to my knowledge, we don't really have all the details worked out what the best management is. Um, I guess I would say if you've purchased fresh milkweed, um, that milkweed is probably fine. You know, it didn't have it uh, probably doesn't have OE on it. So uh, as the monarchs eat your existing milkweed, um, I would imagine if you've got tons of caterpillars, you're gonna have to be, you're gonna be, <laughs> you're gonna be transplanting those caterpillars onto the fresh milkweed anyway, um, at which point the old milkweed, you could just cut it down. Um, there's, I don't have a good answer because it is tough once you kind of get into that tropical milkweed cycle with monarchs breeding in your, in your backyard on the plants, it's it's tough. So um, yeah, I would just say to uh, try and get them onto the fresh milkweed and then, you know, like the good thing about tropical milkweed is that when you cut it back, it will grow back. It is totally fine with being chopped back. So um, if you get them off onto the fresh milkweed, um, you know, you can try that, but you know, it's, it's really hard to know what the, uh, parasite load is on any given plant. If you've got a lot of female monarchs that landed on that plant to lay eggs, you know, those caterpillars could already be infected. There's really no, there's not a great way for you to know. So um, yeah, I would just say, do your best to try and keep supplying them with fresh milkweed. Okay, and then last question uh, is from Trudy, is the city of San Luis Obispo a suitable place for milkweed plants? A great question. So San Luis Obispo is really interesting because we actually do have overwintering sites here. And in fact, they are really, when you look at a map of all the overwintering sites on the coast, San Luis Obispo is the farthest inland. It's the farthest inland of really just about anywhere else. All of the other overwintering sites are within just maybe a couple of miles, either right on the coast or only a mile or two from the coast. San Luis Obispo is like 10 miles from the coast. We're really, it is a unique little microclimate. So we do have active overwintering sites here in the city that do have monarch butterflies. And for that reason, I actually would discourage people from planting milkweed within the city, even though the climate is actually right for milkweed. You can definitely grow it, it will grow here. Um, so just because we do have several overwintering sites within the city, I would, I would discourage people from planting more milkweed. If you already have it, I'm not going to tell you to rip it out, but if you want to do something and you live in San Luis Obispo, I would advocate strongly for nectar planting, because I think that's really going to provide more benefits for monarchs that are arriving rather than kind of planting milkweed in a spot that maybe wouldn't be the greatest. So um, if you live in Eastern San Luis Obispo County, I would say go nuts on the milkweed, but um, in the city, I would urge people to maybe move a little, move away from milkweed and towards nectar. So hopefully that answers the question. That was great. Jessica Griffiths, thank you very much. For coming today. And Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all the questions. I know that's there's there's always a lot to talk about, but um, hopefully, if if any of you folks are going to the uh, to the walk today, then I can continue to to answer questions there. So thank you guys 
so much. Thank you, um, Annika, for having me. Um, and thank you to the Botanical Garden for hosting this program. It's been a pleasure.